So once again, it is my pleasure to welcome Peter Sanders to deliver the next presentation. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Prof, for your, your warm welcome. It's a great pleasure to be with you here from uh, all over Africa. And I uh, joined you earlier today. It's very good to hear uh, Rick Paul, my old friend, speaking. And we got into our small group as well. So I've been asked to speak on the subject of, of who is my neighbor. So let me just uh, tell you a little bit about my, myself, uh, first of all, and my, my journey. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand. I specialized in general surgery. I served in with my wife and uh, our two small children in Kenya in the late 1980s uh, with the Africa Inland Mission. And then uh, I came to the UK. We had a change of direction there where God called me out of clinical medicine into working with the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK and student ministry. And I did that for 27 years, including 19 as CEO. And you never quite know where God's going to lead you. We, we thought we were going to Africa forever to be uh, missionaries in Africa. And God had other plans for us. And as Rick reminds us, his light <coughs> is a light, his word is a light to our path, but not our horizon. And we cannot hold on to things too tightly as God leads us. So I moved from CMF to, to ICMDA just two years ago. So uh, I've just two years, and this is my family here with my wife, uh, who's a pediatrician and our grandson. <clears throat> and this is my uh, oldest boy, Chris, who's a language teacher. This is my second boy, Ben, who's married to, to Caroline. <clears throat> and Caroline's just gone into hospital today um, to be induced with her second baby. So we're, we're praying to God for a safe delivery over the next 24 hours or so. And this is my youngest son, uh, Jono, who's uh, married to uh, Jessa. Uh, she's American and um, Caroline is German and English. So we're a very multinational family. Uh, these, are the, these are the two doctors here. So the medicine carries on. So this is where I trained <clears throat> the University of Auckland Medical School. Um, I initially went to medical school back in the 19, late 1970s, the Grafton campus there. And then my wife has served during her medical years. She did uh, some work in a, a medical elective in the mountains of Nepal at this mission hospital called Ampipal. So we had a very early call into medical missions and that then took us to Kenya where we served at the Kapsawa Hospital in the late 1980s. Here's the uh, opening of that hospital. And then we went to the UK to go to a missionary training college called All Nations. We had 140 students from 70 countries there. Some were doctors and nurses, others were engineers and pilots and uh, Bible teachers, all seeking to work cross-culturally. That was a, an amazing two years. And we thought we were going back to Africa, but God called me out of medicine, out of clinical medicine into student ministry with medical students. And I did that for nine years and then became CEO of the Christian Medical Fellowship. So we never quite know where God is going to lead us. This is the, the CMF uniting and equipping Christian doctors and nurses to live and speak for Jesus Christ. And of course, one of the over 80 movements that is a member of the ICMDA where I now work. And this is the next generation you can see that the photo bombers here. This is in Liberia in West Africa. And this is this is not me. This is my my second son, Ben, who's now training to be a pediatrician and served in Liberia with his wife, uh, with the uh, SIM International Mission and had uh, an amazing time there. So it, it's amazing to see how many of the sons and daughters of those of us who went through the missionary training college have ended up back in Africa or Asia or, or uh, wherever God calls. And you never know uh, where God might call you. So Africa has always been very close to my heart and still is. But I've been asked today to talk about who is my neighbor. And I wanted to take you back to a very familiar passage in scripture, the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke uh, chapter 10. And I'll just uh, read this out. You, you've got it uh, on your in your Bibles, but it's also here from the NIV. On one occasion, an expert in the law 
uh, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers and they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, that's about two days wages, so quite a lot of money, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And so uh, it's only in Luke's gospel that we read this story. Luke, of course, was a doctor. And it's interesting uh, in this story, he talks about the medical treatment that was given to this man, oil and wine. We see Luke's uh, medical uh, knowledge coming out. In this and it's a story we all know and I want to take a fresh look at it today. In the UK now there is an organization called the Samaritans. It's named after this story of course and uh, they have 20,000 volunteers and people who are uh, anxious or depressed or lacking purpose or in a crisis will ring them up and uh, get help and support from them or based on that idea. There are many similar organizations in other countries based on the idea of the Good Samaritan. But who are the Samaritans, first of all? Well, we know that back in the time of, uh, uh, just after Solomon, after King Saul and David then Solomon, the, the kingdom of Israel split into two. There was a southern kingdom of Judah, and there was a northern kingdom of Israel in the yellow and the blue here. And its capital was Samaria, and that's where the word Samaritans come from. And uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. So uh, 2,700 years ago, they destroyed it. Israel were taken away into captivity. And some of them came back, some of them stayed, but they intermarried with other people. They changed their scriptures. They lost their identity. And the Samaritans were regarded as uh, apostates as, uh, as heretics by the Jews. They were despised because they didn't think they followed the true religion. And you can see our story here, this man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this doesn't look very far on the map, but it's 18 miles or 30 kilometers, and Jerusalem's very high. The Dead Sea here is very low, and it's a descent of 3,200 feet. So this was a very, very long journey through uh, rocky paths, lots of places where robbers could hide and no one to protect you. And this man almost certainly was a Jew because he was coming from Jerusalem, but going down into Samaritan territory. So, so it, it's a story about uh, a Samaritan who helps a man from another culture with which there have been centuries of hostility because the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel, the Northern Kingdom fought many thousands, tens, even hundreds of thousands of people killed in those battles. So there was, there was centuries of hostility. And yet uh, God brought a Jewish man across the Samaritan's path. And he's got no relationship with the man. He doesn't know him, he's from a different tribe, the language and uh, accent and everything will be different, the religious practices are different, but he has the ability to help him and he does so, and he does it at considerable personal cost. And so we need to understand this background in order to understand the story. 
And there are two uh, big questions in this story. There's a number of questions, but two main ones. The, the one the expert of the law asked, he said, who was my neighbor uh, to Jesus? When he said, loving your neighbor is the important command. Who is my neighbor, he says. And, and what he was saying really was, who do I have a responsibility to help? Uh, who's in my immediate family or my tribe or whatever? I think that was the kind of answer he was expecting because we read he was trying to justify himself. And then uh, Jesus asked quite a different question not who is my neighbor, he answered it by telling the story, but, but he asked, who do you think was a neighbor? Who do you think was a neighbor to the man who was set about by robbers? So the expert in the law is asking, who have I got a responsibility to help? Who is my neighbor? But Jesus is, is asking the question, how can we be, how can you be a neighbor? See, you see, he was saying the expert in the law had the wrong question because he was asking a question to absolve himself, excuse himself from responsibility. So this person's not my neighbor, I don't have to help them. But Jesus was saying, no, uh, being a neighbor actually means being prepared to help a person from a different culture, background with whom you may have hostility, even your enemy, who you have the power to help. This is a great book, Jesus is the Question. Did you know that, that uh, Jesus asked 307 questions in the Gospels. He loved asking questions. Uh, he, he was asked 183 questions and he answered only eight directly. So uh, more than 20 times, 19 times out of 20, Jesus did not answer questions directly because he was trying to teach people and make them think. And again, he could have given this man the answer to his question, who is my neighbor? But instead, instead he wanted to get this man to think about what his responsibilities were. So let's uh, just remind ourselves of the, how this begins. The expert asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So that's what he was asking, to be part of God's kingdom. And uh, so Jesus didn't answer the question. He asked a question back, what's written in the law and how do you read it? And this man quotes two uh, passages from scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, I think the man was wanting a very simple, simple formula by which he could gain eternal life. But uh, Jesus said, you've got to do this and you'll live. But that raises the question, can anyone do this? Can anyone really love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves. Now, these two commandments are, we're told, the most important commandments in the law. Jesus himself says that in Matthew 22 and Mark 12. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. One comes from Deuteronomy 6.5, a passage beloved of the Jewish people, and the other from Leviticus 19.18. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself but can anyone do this that's the question and the scriptures tell us of course that no one reaches the mark no one can actually do this if we go to romans chapter 3 we see uh, paul the apostle quoting a whole lot of old testament scriptures to prove this fact there's no one righteous not even one there's no one who understands there's no one who seeks god they've all turned away uh, Psalm 14 and 53. Their throats are open graves, Psalm 5. The poison of vipers is on their lips, Psalm 140. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, uh, Psalm 10. Their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know, Isaiah 59. There's no fear of God before their eyes, Psalm 36. And then uh, he finishes off by saying, therefore, see, this is his argument. All these things are true about all human beings. All these things are true. Therefore, no one, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. You see, although the command to love God and love neighbor sum up the whole of the law, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by obeying them. Because through the law, through these laws, we become conscious of our sin we see that we cannot actually do this in and of ourselves. No one reaches the mark. 
And, and yet uh, we, we hear that this man, he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He wanted to justify himself. But uh, as Paul goes on to say, apart from the law, the righteousness of God's been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Right, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And he goes on to say, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, this man tried to justify himself. He thought he could be good enough to be justified in God's sight. But, but what the scripture tells us is that all have sinned and fallen short. And the only way we can be justified is to be justified by God, not by justifying ourselves. And we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. You see, we cannot earn a right standing with God because none of us can do it. We have to be made right with God through faith. And that happens through how through the sacrifice of atonement, through the shedding of Christ's blood. And you know, today is uh, Good Friday, of course. And uh, this is the very day that Jesus died on the cross all those years ago. And this uh, brings us right back to the real meaning of Easter. And this is a very famous painting by Francisco uh, de Zubaran, uh, which took four years for him to do. He did about eight of these paintings beautiful painting, and it shows a lamb tied up uh, to be sacrificed uh, and lying on a, a block of wood. Do you see that on a, on, the, on a cross? And so this is representing the teaching, as I see, say here, right at the very heart of the Christian faith, whereby God makes peace with estranged and condemned human beings through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on a cross. This is the real meaning of Easter. And we see this thread all the way through the Bible. We call it substitutionary atonement because God substitutes Jesus to die in our place for our sins in order that we might be atoned, paid for, or made at one with God, reconciled with him. And we see this thread all the way through scripture. So in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve are thrown out, they're clothed with skins from animals. An animal is killed to provide protection from God's wrath to Adam and Eve as they're sent out into the world because they can no longer exist in God's presence. Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac and a substitute, a ram, is uh, provided by God so that Isaac's life can be saved. Of course, the Passover involved killing a lamb or goat and putting its blood on the doorpost of the houses in Egypt so that when the angel of death passed over, the Jewish people were protected. The whole Jewish sacrificial system, whereby uh, sheep and goats and bulls were killed for and sacrificed for people's sins, is a reminder that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And yet uh, that rams and goats and bulls were never enough. It needed to be a perfect human sacrifice. The day of atonement that the Jews celebrated once a year when a, a goat was sent out into the wilderness carrying the sins of the people was also uh, consistent with this idea of substitutionary atonement. But all of these things were prophetic. They were looking forward to the coming of Jesus who would die on a cross for our sins. Because uh, we're told that Jesus is the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. You know, even before the world was made, uh, it, this was planned in the mind of God that Jesus was the lamb who was slain. Because by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
the, the blood of rams and goats was never enough, but Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus as God and man, pays for our sins forever. What a glorious and wonderful truth this is. And we see this all through scripture. This uh, passage today was preached on in our church here in England, uh, Isaiah 53, which told, tells us 700 years before Jesus was uh, on the earth, that he would take our pain and bear our suffering, that he was pierced for our transgressions, that he was crushed for our iniquities, that the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed, that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus pays the price for our sins and our transgressions in order to make us whole, our wonderful Savior. And we see this all the way through the Old, the, the New Testament as well. It's the absolute heart of Christianity that we're celebrating this day on Good Friday, that Jesus described his own ministry as giving his life as a ransom for many to pay the price for us that we might be uh, reunited with God. Peter, the apostle, tells us he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Uh, he suffered, as Peter says, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was the only one who could pay the price for our sins. In the same way, Paul tells us again and again and again to the Romans, to the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, that Christ died for us that he died for our sins on our behalf. Uh, Paul tells Timothy that Christ gave himself as a ransom for all people. The writer of Hebrews adds that Christ died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. You see, so this question that uh, the, this lawyer asked, he, we're told in order to justify himself, he said, who is my neighbor? But, uh, and Jesus said, well, he, 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 uh, he gave these two commands and he demonstrated that no one can justify themselves, you see. And, and the, the first thing that we really need to take from this story of the Good Samaritan before we look at its practical application, and we're going to move on to its practical application very soon, is that we need to start by realizing that actually the real Good Samaritan is Jesus, the only good Samaritan, because Jesus crossed the boundary. As the Samaritan crossed the boundary between the Samaritans and the Jews, he crossed the boundary between heaven and earth. As the Samaritan tended the wounds of this man, he entered our world, he rescued us from death, he carried us to safety, and he tended our wounds at great cost to himself. Jesus is the real good Samaritan. But he calls us as his followers to, to go and do likewise, to look in his footsteps, to wash one another's feet, to carry his cross. And I think it's quite interesting that the story of the Good Samaritan is lodged in uh, Luke chapter 10 between two other stories. One of them is the sending of the 72, where uh, Jesus sends out 72 people after the disciples to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. And uh, the story which immediately follows it is the devotion of Mary, where uh, Mary and Martha, of course, Christ visits them, and we're told that Mary listened to Jesus. She, she was at Jesus' feet listening to him. And so this, this lawyer who came and asked this clever question, the question he thought was clever, on either side of the story, we learn about... Uh, what's really important. Uh, we see in the life of Mary, what's really important is listening to Jesus and being with Jesus. And as we see from the 72, being sent out by Jesus into the world to carry out his mission to preach and to heal. So uh, just as we're told in Mark 3.14 that God called or Jesus called the 12 disciples why? Why did he call them? To be with him and to be sent out by him. In the same way, he called Mary to be with him, to listen to him, and then the 72 to go out. And so 
in the same way uh, Jesus is the real good Samaritan, but we're called to go and do likewise. So let's look at the practical applications of this. And, and I think what we see in this passage, you've got here Vincent van Gogh's painting of the Good Samaritan, the man lifting the, this man's broken body onto, the, onto the, uh, the donkey. And we've got four attitudes that I want to look at, the robber, the priest, and Levite, who I've categorized together, and the innkeeper. Uh, and then finally, the Samaritan, the robber, the priest, Levite, the innkeeper, and the Samaritan. And there are four attitudes to others. And where you can imagine, uh, you can guess which attitude that we're wanting to emulate. But as Christ's followers, we need to understand these other attitudes and to recognize them in ourselves and to turn from them when we see them. And so the first attitude we see is the attitude of the robber, uh, which I call the criminal attitude. And the criminal attitude says this, what's yours is mine if I can get it. See, these robbers hid behind a rock. They sprung out and uh, they took this man's possession. They took his health because they beat him. They nearly took his life. What's yours is mine if I can get it. That's the criminal attitude. <clears throat> and we see the criminal attitude all over the world today. We've seen it, haven't we, just this week in Mozambique where that uh, group of terrorists attacked Palmer and killed dozens of people chased thousands of others into the forest and are moving down the Mozambique coast to, to Pemba, even as we have our meeting here today. We, we see the criminal attitude at the moment in uh, Myanmar, where a bunch of criminals called the army have taken control of the country and are killing civilians. The criminal attitude. We saw the criminal attitude on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea when an ISIS took Christian believers, Egyptian Christian believers, and killed them on the shores of the, of, the, of the Mediterranean Sea. And we see the criminal attitude, don't we, also in corruption. This is the map of corruption in the world today. You see uh, in, in the African continent, particularly the Middle East area, the darker the red, the more highly corrupt. And uh, we, live, we live in a continent in Africa these are the world's 20 most corrupt countries in the world, according to the world corruption evidence that these are the countries where people in power and politicians, police, army, uh, and so on, officials, public officials uh, are corrupt and take bribes, the worst 20 countries in the world, according to that. And it is, it is uh, a great challenge to us that nine of these 20 countries are in Africa. And that of the, of the worst 10, seven of them are in Africa. What's yours is mine if I can get it. The criminal attitude. And the, the, the challenge to us is, you know, we can steal more things than money from a person. We can take their money and their possessions, which is what these people do. It's what corrupt officials do. But we can take a person's health as well. We can take a person's life, as has been done. But we could also take a person's innocence, take their virginity. We can take a person's reputation by saying things about them that are not true in order to bring them down in the eyes of others. And it's a deep question for us to ask ourselves as, as Christians. What is it that I'm doing that is really motivated by a criminal attitude? We need to remind ourselves where the criminal attitude starts because we exhibit the criminal attitude whenever we take any, from anyone something that is not rightfully ours to take anything. And it begins with the 10th commandment, you shall not cover. Now, Rick talked, didn't he, about envy and pride, but envy and jealousy, that's where it all starts, that we see that people have something that we want and that we're willing to cross the boundary and take it, what's yours is mine, if I can get it. Is there a criminal attitude lurking in our hearts? But what's the answer to the criminal attitude? Well, the scripture tells us that it's contentment, contentment, <coughs> godliness and contentment, as Paul says, learning to be content in all circumstances, not to look 
on others and the things they have or the relationships they have or the job they have or the reputation they have and seek to take it from them or desire it deeply for ourselves. The criminal attitude, what's yours is mine if I can get it, the robber. The next attitude is the common attitude. And we see both the priest and the Levite uh, exhibiting this attitude. What's mine is mine if I can keep it. What's mine is mine if I can keep it. Now we know that the priest and the Levite, <clears throat> they came and they saw the man, didn't they? But they just crossed to the other side of the road and they went on. They, uh, they did not attack the man. They did not take his money. They did not take his clothes. They didn't oppress him. They didn't harm him in any way. They just ignored him. They had the power to do something, but they chose not to. And we often think about sin as doing uh, wrong things, but sin is just as much not doing right things. There are sins of omission, the bad things we choose to do, but of commission, the, the bad things we choose to do. But there are sins of omission, the good things that we could do, that we choose not to do for whatever reason. You know, the Western world at the moment is obsessed with success and wealth and glamour and celebrity and beauty and all of these things. And, you know, they are a wonderful distraction from the things that we ought to be doing. It's so easy to wrap our whole lives up in obtaining uh, these things. And so we ignore the, the hungry and we ignore the sick and we have the power to do something we choose not to. What's mine is mine if I can keep it. And the prophet Ezekiel talked about uh, Jerusalem <clears throat> uh, in these terms, the, the sin of your sister Sodom. Let's talk about uh, Israel, the northern and southern kingdoms, Judah and Israel. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you've seen. But look at these words. She and her daughters, Sodom, we associate Sodom with sexual immorality, don't we? And of course, there was great sexual immorality. But we're told she and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. You see, they were so distracted by their wonderful uh, lifestyles. They had too much to eat. They were unconcerned. These were the sins of omission. We see this in the same way that, that Jesus said, from everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. You know, we're wonderfully privileged as doctors and dentists with fine training, careers, good minds, and so on. We've been given much, and much will be expected from us because uh, real Christianity is very practical. Religion that our God and Father accepts is to look after orphans and widows in their distress to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Uh, as uh, Jesus says to the sheep and the goats in the parable, truly I say to you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. It's not just the bad things we do. It's the good things that we had the power to do that we chose not to do. And look at these, look at these words in 1 John, great challenge, particularly to those of us in the West, where uh, we're so privileged in so many ways. But, uh, but of course, in, in, in all developing countries, there, is, uh, there are the rich and there are poor. And uh, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in actions and in truth. Isn't that challenging? If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity, how can the love of God be in that person? And this is what the, the priest and the Levite demonstrated, the common attitude, what's mine is mine, if I can keep it. And it's not just about uh, 
uh, giving uh, to the needs of the, of the poor and the needy, the sick that we're called to do, but also speaking out for those who have no voice. Think of uh, the unborn, the poor, the dependent elderly, especially in the Western world now, uh, refuge, refugees, asylum seekers, the victims of trafficking. And as uh, Mordecai said to Esther, you're in the king's palace, but if you remain silent at some such a time as this, then uh, deliverance will arise from another quarter, but you and your father's house will perish, you know. And as doctors and dentists, we are respected professionals and we can be a voice for the voiceless and we must not pass by on the other side and say, what's mine is mine if I can keep it. And so again, I, I read these passages, I'm deeply, deeply challenged by them. Uh, what can we keep from others? Are we keeping our time and money, our compassion, our gifts and abilities, our friendship, our teaching? Uh, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll teach my, you'll feed my sheep or our voice or influence that we would have a chance to exercise for others. The common attitude, what's mine is mine if I can keep it. And then we come to the third one, the innkeeper, the commercial attitude. So we've had the criminal attitude, the robber, the common attitude, the priest and Levite, the commercial attitude, the innkeeper. Now, what did the innkeeper say? Well, he said this, what's mine is yours if you can pay for it. What's mine is yours if you can pay for it. <coughs> now, of course, this innkeeper did a lot of good for this man because he provided him accommodation. He provided him with, with care. He provided him with shelter. He provided him with protection. But he did all this because he was being paid to do it. Now, of course, uh, we are, what we, if we're working, we deserve uh, to be remunerated for it. There's nothing wrong with receiving uh, wages. It's wrong if we work uh, in, and, and, and we're not being paid for it. But when we say what's mine is yours only, only if you can pay for it, then we become like the innkeeper, the commercial attitude. Because the flip side, of course, is if you can't pay for it, then what's mine is not yours. We have, of course, seen during this COVID pandemic, uh, a lot of countries have been hit very hard. A lot of people have got, have lost their jobs. They've uh, earned less money. They've been poor. They've unable to access medical care or whatever. But uh, there are parts of the world that, of course, have done very well. The, the big, big tech companies, what we call the FAN companies, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, uh, Alphabet, Microsoft, they're all doing very well. Elon Musk uh, has, has become the world's richest man because of his uh, electric car makers' shares. And so big tech is thriving because there's nothing wrong with making money if you're providing it for, if you're providing goods and services in doing it. But it's when our attitude is, I will only help you if you can pay for it. That's when we follow and we talked about corruption in the developing world but the big problem in the western world whether it's the us or um, or uh, europe japan these are the figures here for the uk and you can see this is the net borrowing that's happened since covid in the last you, you see uh, how much the british government has borrowed and how much our debt has gone up in this last year <clears throat> in fact, uh, much of the world is now in debt, uh, and a lot of it to, to China. These are the countries here with greater than 25% debt to China of their GDP. The red countries, the, the orange countries, 10 to 25%, the, the uh, lightly shaded 5 to 10, 1 to 5, and so on. But you see many of the countries of South America, of Africa in particular, in, in South Asia, uh, Mongolia, and so on, are deeply in debt, but particularly the countries that are most in debt are the Western countries. So corruption, as corruption affects some parts of the world, debt affects others. <clears throat> and the Bible tells us the, the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. See, the godly way to live is to earn more than enough 
than you need yourself so that you have some left over to give to others who cannot have it not to go into debt. And in, uh, in the Western world, debt is because people are buying more and more and more things that they don't need to impress people that they don't like. They borrow uh, to buy more and more and more things which will never make them happy, the commercial attitude, the innkeeper. Now, if we look at the cost of, of health care around the world, half of all the world's 7 billion people still lack access to essential health services. That's a, a mind-blowing statistic. <clears throat> but even more striking, each year about 100 million are pushed into poverty because they must pay for health care out of their own pockets because there are not the social welfare systems or the insurance systems or the charitable care that is available. Nearly 17 million lives lost in 2010 from conditions requiring surgical care. 33 million individuals face catastrophic health expenditure due to payment for surgery and anesthesia each year. <coughs> and the problem with the commercial attitude, which is that if you can't pay for it, then I won't do it for you, is that many, many people in the world will never be able to pay for it and therefore can only have it if it's given generously. <coughs> 2.5 billion people have untreated tooth decay. Uh, these are the, the, the more red or yellow, the, the less expenditure on health. Countries which cannot afford to, to spend. The healthiest countries in the world are those that have the most to spend. But if people cannot afford to spend, then they end up with huge maternal mortality ratios as we see in Africa or huge child mortality ratios. The commercial attitude, what's mine is yours, but only if you can pay for it, will never uh, meet the needs for health and education, food, welfare of the people of the world. So, so uh, that brings us the commercial attitude. And, and the question for us is how much does our does the commercial attitude actually govern what we do in our own lives if we allow this word to examine us, our choice of career or specialty, where we're prepared to work, where we're seeking to live, who we're prepared to help, who we're prepared to treat, or our service in the church, where we only do things that we're paid for, where we only do the things that give us the best possible pay, or are we prepared to say, uh, what's mine is yours, even if you can't afford to pay for it even if you can't afford to pay for it. And that brings us on to the final one, the Christian attitude exemplified by the Samaritan. What's yours is mine if you need it. What's yours is mine if you need it. And we're told this attitude or our attitude should be the same as that of Jesus, who as on this day, Easter Sunday, Easter Friday, Good Friday, we remember that he died on the cross because he was in nature God but emptied himself he took the form of a servant and he humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross and uh, there was an outflow of generosity remember Sodom she was arrogant overfed and unconcerned but did not help the poor and needy but Jesus Jesus was far far richer <clears throat> Jesus owned the whole universe but for our sake, though he was rich, for our sake, he became poor so that through his poverty, we might become rich and be reunited to God. And we know his call to preach good news, to proclaim recovery, uh, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of the sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, preaching, healing, deliverance, justice, service. What Mine is yours if you need it. That was Jesus' attitude. And so uh, we are called in Luke's gospel, of course, just a few uh, chapters earlier, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And of course, this is exactly what the uh, Samaritan did because the Jew was his enemy. 
the Jew had mistreated him, the Jew had discriminated against him and had uh, harbored hostility for centuries. And yet he crossed the cultural boundary and at great personal cost to himself, he served this person just as Jesus did for us crossing our boundary into our world. And we can think of uh, great Christian doctors of the past uh, who have been motivated to serve God. Uh, some of them in the African continent, David Livingston, uh, Helen Rosevere in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, or in, in East Asia, James Taylor, uh, uh, Hudson Taylor, missionary pioneer to China, or Ida Scudder uh, to India, two amazing hospitals in India, Valor and Ludhiana, wonderful teaching hospitals, tertiary referral centers now, producing uh, thousands of doctors, nurses, dentists who serve all over the world, incredibly well trained. Why are those places there? They're there because two women, one from America, one from Scotland, Ida Scudder and Mary Brown, went out in obedience to Christ to start a dispensary, which then became a nursing school, which then became a medical school, which then became a hospital. Two women exhibiting the Christian attitude. What's mine is yours if you need it. Uh, we're very uh, keen on cricket in Britain. We're not very good at cricket in Britain at the moment in some forms of the game. But you may have heard of this man, C.T. Studd. Here he is here, lived in the 19th century. Have you heard of the ashes that uh, England and Australia play for every few years in, in a tournament? And you know, the ashes dates back to a game in the late 19th century when this man, C.T. Studd, was playing for England. And he was the only batsman that was not out in that game. He was a great cricket player. Australia won the match. They burnt the wickets and bales uh, into ash and they put them in this little canister and they took them back to Australia and every few years they play for them. But C.T. Scud left his, uh, his training, his country, his wealth, and he went to China uh, and he uh, formed the World Evangelism Crusade, now known as WEC, uh, and he uh, worked for God in, uh, in China, in um, in India, and then later in Africa as well. And he said, if Jesus Christ is God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make to for him the Christian attitude. And as we've been reminded today by Rick, every day of our lives is written in God's book, that every good work has been planned for us. God's planned good works for us to do before the beginning of time, that we all have a special role in Christ's body, gifts, and abilities that we've been given to serve others. And we have a general calling, but also a personal calling based on how God has formed us. And uh, the question is, are we going to exhibit the Christian attitude? What's yours is mine if you need it. Are we going to take this challenge of Acts 1-8 to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to make disciples of every nation? to go in the same spirit that, that the God the Father sent Jesus Christ. And so we come back to the, the scripture with which we started today. Are we willing to serve? And Isaiah in the temple has this wonderful vision of God. And he hears the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then he said, here am I, send me. And there's the challenge for each one of us, as, as Jesus sat at this spot outside Capernaum uh, at the north end of Galilee and launched a mission that was to go right to the ends of the earth. And he asked us today, who will go for us? And are we going to say, here am I, send me? Because we need to recognize that uh, Jesus is the good Samaritan who's crossed the boundaries from heaven to earth at great cost to himself to bring us healing and new life and to commission us and to send us to do his work. And he calls us to turn away from the criminal attitude, what's yours is mine if I can get it, to turn away from the common attitude, what's mine is mine if I can keep it, to turn away from the commercial attitude, 
what's mine is yours, but only if you can pay for it and to embrace the Christian attitude that he demonstrated through his life and death and calls us into what's mine is yours if you need it.